is and turn into an appropriate motor and behavioral responses. Next, whether um, you're biting into a hamburger or riding a bicycle or reading a book, your successful completion of the activity requires uh, processing sensation or sensory integration. So Heller, if you're going to be reading a book, it's how are, it's, are you able to um, position yourself um, so that you can see the book? Can you hold the book comfortably? Are you able to, um, to see uh, the size of the print that's there? Um, and are you able to take that information in to create meaning for yourself? Do the next. So uh, this is the, most people learn in school about the five senses, about our vision, about our hearing, about our touch, about our taste and our smell. And those uh, help us to learn uh, about things in our environment. But there are three um, senses that have uh, been researched more that really do help um, support and understand our kiddos. Um, that being proprioception, which is your uh, body awareness. Where's your body in space? Do I know if I'm sitting on the chair or am I halfway off? Um, your vestibular sense, which is the information you get from your inner ear, and it tells you about your balance, so that you do, so that um, we know uh, where we where we are in space. Also, those two things go together. And interoception, which is those signals from your internal organs. Am I hungry? Um, am I am I sick? Do I need to use the bathroom? So why are these things important? Um, we have the pyramid of learning here that just show, just gives a nice visual to let us see that, um, that all of our skills are built on the way that our sensations um, are processed. So uh, the way building up through those senses that we just discussed, they build on our postural security, um, on our motor planning, um, and also on our ability to to coordinate our eyes and our hands together to complete tasks. All of these things are going to help us complete the daily living activities through our day. We can click the next. So children need the accurate feedback from their sensory systems to attain the motor planning skills. Um, when we think about motor planning skills, we think about their ability to create ideas, to sequence the steps, to make those ideas happen, and then physically it, being able to execute those motor skills. We also have balance and social participation. So sensory input is to recognize also those dangers in our environment. And we see that, uh, especially with preschoolers that are just learning about their uh, about their bodies and about the environments they're in and, what, and when it is safe. So in early intervention, you could click to the next. In early intervention, we typically assess the sensory processing concerns through standardized checks, such as a sensory profile or a sensory processing measure. These help us gauge how our child is responding Hey, I think you need to unmute yourself. I'm sorry. Seems to be a background. Um, so in early intervention, we use sensory processing uh, a checklist to help us understand um, if there needs to be an intervention. Um, criterion for some of those interventions are our behaviors interfering with their ability to. Um, to it to do school activities or in their role as a student. You can click to the next. So typically the areas of need fall under three major uh, categories, um, that being under responsive. And we see those under responsive kiddos, we think of them as those sensory seekers. They're, um, they crave more input 
Um, and so some of the ways that we support them in the classroom and at home is that they need more opportunities for those preferred inputs during their day to help regulate and calm them so they can attend uh, to their learning activities. We'll talk more in detail when we get to the other senses. And another, uh, another area is over-responsive. And we consider those kids avoiders. They're sensitive uh, to and avoid certain um, sensory inputs. Uh, for instance, one of the ways we would intercede is we would prepare those kiddos for changes in the environment. Like if they're, if I was about to turn on the vacuum, I might, I might prepare a child that's that is sensitive to sound that that was going to happen. Um, we're going to help calm, use a, have a calm adult communicate them previewing what might happen during their day for things that are uh, things that might make them um, frustrated or stressed, things like using a picture schedule. We also might consider calming items, things like tinted glasses, um, if there's bright lights, sound minimizing headphones um, for, loud air, for loud environments, or maybe just something for comfort, like, uh, like their favorite stuffy. Another area of need is um, low registration. And that is something that um, is, can be misunderstood. Um, really, it's the kids that are missing sensory cues from their environment. Those are the kids that may be um, not, they are always uh, bumping into a wall. They're tripping over things. Um, they need several prompts to be able to uh, transition. Um, if a child has those uh, low registration, um, if they have those low registration uh, sensations, they might miss um, things such as being able to uh, complete tasks. They might need support, like giving them visual uh, cues to in the in the bathroom, like pictures of this is the way we pump the soap. Um, with a picture, or we might need to help sing them a little preschool tune that tells them um, to help them remember what the steps are. This is the way we pump our soap, pump our soap, pump our soap. This is the way we wash our hands, wash our hands, wash our hands. These are little things that we can do to help support our kids in remembering those steps. So one of the first um, one of the first uh, senses that we talk about is that most people think about is vision, and how um, that helps helps us to see um, in our environment and typically make sense of the of uh, of our environment, the colors, the shapes, the letters, the words um, in our in the classroom. This sense is also important. Um, it helps us keep track. Um, for safety in the room. So we wanna see if someone is coming towards us so we can get out of the way. Um, if something is falling, maybe we, uh, our juice is falling, we might wanna reach out to catch it. Um, also some kids that have difficulty with the processing visual stimuli also um, are look to be very disorganized and they have difficulty filtering out things. Uh, the four, the four um, the things on our on our that are in the foreground versus the things in the background. So they might have difficulty going to find their shoes in their closet. They might have difficulty focusing on um, on what uh, on an art activity, not knowing what they're supposed to do first. So we can help them by minimizing the clutter. So if we're about if you wanted to do an art activity at home or um, we would take we would take everything else off of a table and just have the art activities that we want them to focus on. Um, we could also use color coding for organization. So all of the things that um, that we are using for our in the in our um, our areas are in the red boxes, and all of the things that we um, that we use for snack are in the green boxes. We can also simplify their environment by just offering them two choices to minimize that. And sometimes our kiddos can be very sensitive to light and 
Um, and I think that as we start to understand um, the kid, our kids, we realize that we might have some similar sensitivities and that might help us be more empathetic and, and help them in changing their environment. Simple things like um, if there are glaring lights, we might be able to put a little cover or a filter over those. Um, we, if there's an environment that we have to go into that we're not able to change the environment, then we can do things like maybe wear a baseball hat or a visor or some sunglasses to try to minimize those glares so that the child can be calmer and be able to focus on the tasks they have to do there. So sound is the is the other sense, and it's really responsible primarily for hear, hearing. But when we think about um, hearing, we separate that into two different things. There's um, first making the sound, and then just hearing the sound, and then determining is that sound um, important important for language, or is it important for safety? So. A lot of the background noise, the reason that we filter, we think about it is it's actually a sensation that lets us know whether or not we're safe in our environment. Um, so if I hear a background noise at first, our kids are going to attend to it right away. And that's typical because if we think back, that's how we stay safe. If you get that feeling when you're walking in a new environment and you're looking over your shoulder all the time, like what was that sound or what is this sound? You're trying to make sure that this new environment is safe for you to be in. And our kids sometimes have difficulty, um, if they have difficulty with auditory processing, they may have difficulty learning, is this a background noise that makes that's just about safety or is this about language? So we sometimes have to look at ways that we can help the kids focus on that. Um, some of the strategies that we do is try to minimize those background sounds um, and also try to give kids cues. Maybe we'll flick a light on and off before we want them to attend uh, to a big direction, a big transition. Maybe we'll, we'll clap twice to get the kids' attention. Um, maybe we'll um, have a little sing song uh, to get it so that it's time to everybody to tune in. Or we might call their name and make sure that we wait, that they look at us first before we're able to give them a verbal direction. Uh, gustatory the sense, the taste is, um, is how we identify what kinds of foods people like and what foods are actually dangerous, foods to stay away from. At this stage in a preschool life, um, they are very concerned with all these new flavors that are coming in. They have more awareness of, uh, of different flavors than they did when they were toddlers. And so now they're starting to um, be a little bit more of a picky eater. But we, there is a difference between that, I'm a little nervous because this is new and I am, um, and I am a problem feeder because I am so resistant to bringing in any new taste or any new textures. And typically when we um, start to think about that, we think kids that have um, less than 30 foods, they're going to be considered um, picky eaters. Kids less, uh, kids less than um, 10 to 20 foods, they're going to be considered problem feeders. And so, you might want to get some support from a pediatrician. Um, they might have concerns, really extreme food preferences, and um, they might only eat certain colors of foods. They may only eat certain textures. And if it starts to impact their nutrition or their diet, that's when we'd want to seek out um, some support from your pediatrician. There's also a great link here um, that is called uh, yourkidstable.com. And she is um, an occupational therapist who happens to have children that are picky, have been problem feeders. And she's excellent in giving strategies about how to set up your daily um, activity, your daily meals to try to make them um, more accessible and easier for, um, for trying to explore. Um, what we know from the research now is that a child doesn't actually know if they like a food in the um, until they've tried it 10 times. 
And that may seem extreme as an adult, but um, as you've grown up, as you're growing up, your tastes will change. And at first you're just, as kids, you're just realizing it's not, it's not dangerous. <laughs> and then we wanna move into whether or not we enjoy that and is it paired with positive experiences? Did we, did, were we playing, um, were, was that, did I make my broccoli a tree? Did I shake some Parmesan cheese on it to turn it into snow? Did, am I having positive connections to that in addition to just the texture and the taste of it? We can move on. Now your olfactory um, is your smell. It's considered one of the oldest uh, systems in the brain and it is connected to our memories and our emotions. Um, the input of a smell could cause us to feel comfort, alarm, depending on the smell. So I know that everybody's very worried if you smell a burning smell, we're always trying to figure out um, where is that coming from? I think just the other day there was a smell and everybody was on alert trying to track down what that smell was. I think that everybody knows what the smell of burning popcorn smells like. You have a very visceral reaction to some smells, but we also have those positive. I remember what the rose smell my grandmother smelled like. There are positive reactions also. So we wanna consider that when we're, um, when we're setting up learning environments and even comforting environments for our kids. So maybe if we know about the comforting calming scents like lavender or vanilla or geranium, they come in lotions or essential oils. We can put them in scented bean bags. You can put those bean bags in stuffed animals. They even have stuffed animals now that you can buy that have essential oils in them that are calming. And those may be good for uh, sleep. They may be good for transitions, for car rides. I've used um, wristbands, sweatbands, and um, for kiddos, and we put a little essential oil on that. And the kids, when they're feeling stressed, will uh, will give it a sniff. Um, but we also have to keep in mind that that the things that calm us might not calm our our kids. They may be a little overreactive to that. So really keep that in mind um, with wearing perfumes and colognes. And if you're someone that is uh, if you're noticing that, if you could communicate that to the adults around them, sometimes uh, grandparents are not aware how um, the reactions that the, that a child is having, and it really can be um, that they are overwhelmed by some sense. And this is the uh, the tactile system. And that really aids the touch. It's how we respond to the physical stimuli through um, the receptors in our skin. Um, it helps us locate if we're feeling pain um, in our body. And it helps us determine, again, if we're safe and if we're dangerous, uh, if there's a dangerous touch. And sometimes if you're, if you're, you're feeling the temperature of the heat, um, that I should recoil and move away. Um, sometimes if a kid is a person is struggling with this uh, tactile processing, they may misinterpret some light touch as negative. Sometimes people always want to, they think they're being silly and they want to do tickling, but for some kids, it can actually feel really threatening. It can feel almost like they're being poked and because they're misinterpreting in that. And so being able to um, recognize those things and, uh, and teach the child if they're capable to tell them that they, to stop, that they don't like that, and, and help them communicate that to the people around them that love them, that that's something that they don't enjoy. It's a good way to help teach them boundaries. A person beca can become even more um, anxious during these times when they're, when they're in interfering with this, and they might go into a fight or flight response. They might pull away, um, even from a light touch. So sometimes you might see our kids will have extreme reactions and, and when you didn't have the intention, when you were just trying to be silly, you might be overwhelmed by that extreme reaction. But what we need to do at these times is realize that they were not in control of it. It's really a fight or flight response. It's their nervous system is kicking in and they're, having, they're trying to protect themselves. So we want to help them 
by, um, by staying calm and helping them work through it and be able to give them the words that they need to communicate that. Now, some things that we can do throughout the day when our kiddos are feeling that is really use that calming, that calming um, touch, which is that deep pressure touch. So teachers can give a calming squeeze. Um, they can offer fidgets where they get to squeeze things with their hands, uh, lots of sensory balls or a pop tube they can squish back and forth. Um, they, little even connector toys where like Legos or Duplo blocks that we can be pushing back and forth. Those things will give us nice calming deep pressure input. We can expose children slowly through deep, through um, to different textures, through things that they enjoy. If they're someone that loves to bake, loves to eat, we can kind of encourage them through um, exploring things in baking. Um, if they're someone that is an, interested in art, we can help them by giving them different, um, different materials and art to touch and explore. Um, if they are sensitive, we do the biggest, uh, the biggest thing we want to keep in mind is that we want them to participate. So it's not important that they do things exactly the way that we had in mind, that, they're, that their hands are in, they're squeezing it and squishing it, and they're enjoying every aspect of that. Maybe they're not at that stage yet, but, that, but one thing that we can do is give them those opportunities. Give them, instead of uh, using small spoons, maybe they need the biggest spoon in your, in your drawer. You know, they need the big wood spoon and they need to, they need to touch it from about two feet away. But the important part here is they're participating and you're creating this loving experience and memory with them. So we're going to also have nice towels or uh, paper towels right next to them. Sometimes I like to have what I call the cleaning bowl. I put a little bit of warm water in a bowl and the kids can rinse their hands if they're sensitive to that and dry them off. And they didn't have to leave the area of the activity. They didn't leave that experience with you. They're still, they're still sharing that opportunity. Um, some things that are really helpful at home for those kids that are sensitive. If you're, if they're having all of these experiences during their day that they're having difficulty, difficulty controlling and all of this light touch, um, they may be sensitive to their clothing. So looking at the tags on their clothing and the smoothness of the seams of their clothing, that might help to calm them and exploring things like, um, like massage, using nice deep pressure, using um, a calming oil or a lotion that, um, that uh, they enjoy is also a nice way to calm. And there is wonderful research on how, um, on, on the impacts of massage and how that can support a good healthy sleep, which everybody needs both kids and parents. So um, with that, that, there's lots of great research out there that we can use to help support these kids in calming their bodies. Proprioception is, um, and is, not, a, uh, is not one of the senses that, that um, people typically know about. It's actually, the way that our um, body takes in information from our joints, from our muscles and from our ligaments and tendons, and it sends that information from to our brain. So um, the be a, children are under responsive to proprioception, they may have difficulty determining where their muscles and joints are located. So whether their bodies are relaxed or in tension and how different body parts respond, um, they may seek out activities like jumping on your furniture or grasping things really tightly. They may have difficulty getting dressed um, because they're not sure where to put their body parts, where the arms go, where the legs go. Um, and they might have difficulty um, doing grading their muscle activities. So they may pick up, they may use big force to pick up everything which um, if it works for their thermos, they may be picking up their thermos and realize, ah, oh, my thermos is really heavy. I'm gonna pick it up with both hands and drink it. But then they go to a restaurant and someone gives them, or grandma's house and somebody gives them a little light plastic cup. They might not know to change how much force they use, which may result in a spill. 
But these things, when we understand why they're doing it, we can better help uh, kind of um, intervene during those times, knowing that that might be harder for them to do. We also will understand that they may not be, um, you know, slamming doors on purpose, that it might be that they need to use a lot of force. So we can talk a lot about activities that are, so are, are soft and hard or quiet and loud, how we can close the doors. Using those deep pressures to the muscles, it's real is really calming to the system. It um, it has been proven that the the hugs, the oxytocin that is released during those big bear hugs, are so calming. And so when we think about calming our child, typically um, this works in that this works in almost all situations. <laughs> you know, we have to. We it depends on how, what the chat what type of proprioception that child enjoys, whether it is those big bear hugs, whether it's the hand squeezes, whether they need to move their body themselves and go out and climb on the playground equipment, um, if, they, if they need to um, be able to stay focused on an activity like cleaning up, we can uh, put everything in a, bit, in a laundry basket or a box and have them push those boxes away to get those that deep pressure where they're, they're have it, they're feeling a little stressed after they're finishing an activity. You can help calm them by helping them give a helper job. They can wipe the tables, give them a big towel and having them push back and forth. Not only um, are they getting that input into their, um, into their muscles to help calm them, but also you're giving, the adults are giving them reinforcement for being a good helper. And so they're getting that emotional support also. Some children really do benefit by things like compression or weighted vests in short intervals during the day to give them that deep pressure that they need to uh, their trunk to calm them so that they can sit and attend to activities. Um, you can also include that extra, uh, extra input to their muscles during seated activities, things like um, if they're sitting down and you're going to read a book, maybe you provide them um, with a fidget or with things that they can um, they can build with, like pegs or like like Duplo blocks. They can hold those together or use putty if you're wanting to read a book to them, but they're having trouble staying with you. That's one of those considerations that you can do is give them something in their um, in their hands. Also. Um, to consider if you're wanting them to focus, to read a book that maybe they're not able to sit in a chair, maybe they need to be in your lap, maybe they need to get that deep pressure hug from you while they're, while they're trying to focus on that book. Let me turn the next. So the vestibular system um, is a sense that detects movement. Um, through sensory receptors in our ear. So uh, if um, you'll know that if you're walking and you're, um, if you've ever had a cold and you start to feel like you're a little bit off balance, if you had a sinus, sinuses, it can feel like your head is heavy and that maybe you're tilting forward. Um, this is a little bit of an insight into how some of our kids can feel when they're not getting accurate vestibular input. So it helps you, this is gonna help your body maintain its balance and be aware of where we are in space. So we don't want to feel like you're falling off the edge of things. You'll see some of our kiddos are always on the edge of their chairs. They may be tiltering off. They may be sitting on their, um, on their knees um, on the edge of things. When they sit on their, on their knees, they're probably trying to give themselves what we just learned about that that extra input from their muscles. They're like, where am I in space? I'm not sure on this chair. And so all the adults are always trying to tell them, sit on your bottom, sit on your bottom. But what they're probably trying to tell us is that they really need more input to know where their bottom is and how they're sitting there. So what kinds of things can we do to help, the, help these kids? Um, because typically they're the kids that are bumping into things. Um, they can be labeled as clumsy. Um, they may enjoy 
lots of movement activities, dancing, jumping. These are our amazing spinners that can that can spin and spin. Um, and if they're not spinning, um, if they're not spinning their bodies, they enjoy finding toys that spin. So those are little clues into um, that they're having difficulty with uh, integrating this input. Um, we can change their seating to include them to include a little bit of movement into their seating. So there are air cushions. Um, we call them movement cushions, and we can sit them in the chair, and then they can sit on the chair and kind of wiggle back and forth to get better input about where their body is. Um, they could use a rocking chair where they can rock back and forth and their feet can hit the ground and get nice deep pressure and they'll get good input there. Um, other opportunities um, that we can offer before they sit, um, before we want them to sit in a structured activity, um, one of the most alerting things that we can do is actually invert our head. Um, and so you'll actually see that a lot in yoga poses and also in a lot of arousing things. So they'll do what they call a sun salutation. So you'd reach up to the sky and then bend all the way down and touch your toes and then come back up and do it again. Um, downward dog is a typical thing where your hands are on the floor and your head is down. Um, we do things like animal walks where all the where we make the kids be um, the bear or the lion and their head is tilted downward. And maybe we'll do those activities before we want to go and do a seated activity at um, in circle time or at the table. And that's going to help uh, arouse those kids and give them um, give their nervous system the input that they need so that they can better focus. But one of the things to consider when with vestibular input is that um, is that they are that there's the basic rule is that linear movement, that nice calming movement, you think about rocking your baby back and forth, that's the calming movement, but spinning is very alerting. And if we see our friend, see our little kids that are spinning a lot, um, they might need that, but they might not also be able to integrate that. And when I say integrate it, it means that they could keep spinning and keep spinning, but they're not getting the the uh, they're not getting that satisfying input to their system that gives them that allows them to be calm. And typically, what they're what's happening there is that they actually um, need help to integrate that movement. And one of the things that we can do is give them some uh, give them some deep pressure. So if they are if they need spinning, maybe a good activity is to play ring around the rosy, where we squeeze and hold hands and we we ring around, uh, we go in a circle and then we and then we have to crash down and then we have to get up and we get to do it again. So this way they're getting that spinning movement with some deep pressure that they need to help integrate that that input. Now, the interoceptive system is the eighth, eighth sense, and it's really just been researched a lot more in the last 10 years. And we've uh, been really lucky that even in Pennsylvania, we've had some uh, great research happening to learn more about, um, more about interoception. And it is the uh, it's the way that the human body in, um, understands and reacts to the your physiological state. It allows the brain to understand um, if you're feeling hungry, if you're thirsty, if you're in pain, um, if you're if you're the temperature is too cold or too hot, if you need to use the bathroom. So those sensations that you're getting from your stomach, from your bladder, from your heart, from your skin, it's uh, it's again, telling us whether or not um, we're safe. So much of our sensory systems are really all about telling us whether or not we're safe and that we can continue to participate. And so when we start to understand those things better, um, we can help our kids participate more in their own life, feel safe and participate. So some interventions at this early age right now in preschool, we're really just learning what all of these signals are. And a lot of that is 
from our parents helping us connect them. So we can do that through giving the kids great routines. Like we typically eat at the regular time. We typically go to use the bathroom at the same time. Um, we can use communication strategies like, like, oh my, like, oh my goodness, mommy's, mommy's face is so red. I'm feeling so hot and sweaty right now. Um, I need to cool down. So you, you helping to communicate when you're feeling that way is going to help them start to make those connections. If you notice that they are red and that their skin is red and they are sweaty, that they're hot, we can do, we can offer them a choice. Oh, do you need to be cooled down? Do you need a drink of water? You're helping to make that connection with this feeling is being hot. And the thing I do to feel better is get a drink of water or I can get, or I can go inside and cool down. You're at, we have to specifically teach some of our kids that don't get those good signals um, how to do that in a more specific way because they may not be observing that as easily. Another thing that we need to consider is that um, a lot of the signals that we get from our, uh, from our internal organs are the ones that help us to understand our feelings. You know, first you're starting to understand the basic things like, oh, I'm growling. My stomach is making growling sounds. I'm hungry um, or that I have tears. And this means that I'm sad. My heart is starting to race. I feel scared. These are all um, things that help us know. And if I feel like before a presentation, if you're feeling nervous and my heart is starting to beat, I need to take some deep breaths and calm down. But our kiddos don't know this, that that beating heart might make them feel even scared, more scared. And they might need our comfort, our ability to help regulate them. We call that that co-regulation. We're teaching them how to calm down. And at this stage in their life, that's what they need the most. When, we, when they're feeling that way and we can help them understand what it is they're feeling and we can give them the comfort that they need, they'll know to seek that out when they're feeling like that again. And eventually they'll learn how to do that for themselves. Typically, a lot of the um, ability to uh, understand the inner reception systems and your feelings comes a little bit later in the school age. So at this stage, it's a lot on the parents and the teachers to help them. You can go to the next. I want to mention a sensory diet. When people think about diets, they think about all the good foods that make them feel good and make them feel healthy. When um, occupational therapists talk about sensory diets, we're talking about what are the right sensory inputs in your child's daily routine that can help support their ability um, to learn motor skills, to be calm and to attend to learning activities and social opportunities so that they can uh, play and make friends. So one, uh, one term for um, one of the ways that we do this is for example, if a child has some poor trunk strength, uh, they don't have good muscle strength in their trunk and they seek out a lot of proprioceptive input, a lot of heavy duty input. Some of the things um, that we can do is that we can give them a really nice sturdy chair with a high back and with good strong arms so that they can move around in that chair and feel the boundaries and feel safe. They can have their feet firmly placed on the floor. Um, they might, we might put an air-filled cushion in there so that um, they can wiggle back and forth or that air cushion might even be on an angle. So my feet are pushing into the floor even more and I'm getting more deep pressure about, and that tells me where I'm sitting and where my body is. And when I'm getting that grounding deep pressure, um, now it's easier for me to focus on the activity that's in front of me right now. So at home, you can do the same things like the rocking chairs or having children sit in your lap or bounce on a ball a little bit while you're looking or reading a book. These things um, will help them to learn those skills. You also might notice that maybe your child needs that they need to eat their lunch um, they eat more of their lunch if they play outside first. Maybe they're able, after they've moved around, they're able to sit and eat for longer. Um, it might be easier for them to fall asleep 
if you notice that maybe they're sensitive to visual input. So I really need to make sure that that tablet or that TV is off like for an hour or an hour and a half before they go to bed because they're, they, they need time to, to calm down from that visual input. Maybe that's a time when we need to do quiet things together. So you really have to start to be a detective in your child's life and start to learn. And of course, your teachers and therapists are here to also give you feedback on that. Go to the next page. This is just a, a little sensory diet cheat sheet um, that we offer up, just things like, uh, what are good ways to get that input to our muscles? We can do things like crawl on our hands and knees. We can stomp, we can jump. We can um, play inside a body sock, which is um, really basically a big stretchy pillowcase. So we, the kids will get in it and they'll use their arms and they'll push out, but they'll get lots of deep pressure input and it's nice and silky smooth, so it feels great. Um, we'll look at, uh, for the vestibular input, we'll look at bouncing and rocking, swaying uh, and dancing. Kitchen, there's, you cannot ever underestimate the power of a kitchen dance party. That sometimes is very helpful before we need to sit down and eat. Looking at um, the deep pressure from the tactile system, things like that massage, things like a weighted blanket. We also have, um, you know, sometimes we'll, open up a, a favorite stuffy and we'll put and we'll put um, a, ba a bag of uh, pellets or beans in there sewn up really well and put it in and have them sitting on top of it. So not only do you have that emotional comfort of your favorite stuffy, but he's also got a little extra weight on your lap that helps to calm your system. Um, also, we want to look at um, the auditory system, things that might help during your day. Maybe you're noticing that your kiddo um, really calms down when they have classical music playing in the background. Maybe they need some Disney piano music that works at my house. Um, maybe you need some old school, um, you know, you need some old school r and It what whatever works for your child and you and you want to create. Maybe they need to be aroused and we need to get some faster dance music going on. And that's something to consider during the day. Maybe you're worried about your child falling asleep too early because they might not sleep through the night. Maybe you need to time your dance party right after dinner to, to get everybody moving before we go into the slow down period. And then we want to look at those visual systems. If we want to alert your visual system, maybe you want to pick toys with, it, with that light up and excite the child and want them to play and to come over to it. But if we... Um, if they have moving parts, if they're gears and they spin, um, those things can encourage it. Another thing that's um, fun is a lot of flashlight play. If you're wanting to start to dim the lights, um, some of our kids are sensitive to those lights, we'll start to dim them for like a half an hour, the hour before bed. Flashlight play is a really fun thing, a flashlight tag is if you're laying on the bed and you uh, and you have uh, you have flashlights and you have to catch them or you have to create shadow puppets. Um, we'll have somebody sit, you can always have uh, somebody else, you have, have your brother or sister creating silly movements while the kids are the ones in charge of the flashlights. These are all little um, things that can help to support the kids' uh, engagement in their, in their, in their day and um, finding out what things do help and how we can put them in a schedule so we do them at a routine time is really gonna help the flow of the day and the child to gain those, those participation skills that they need to grow and learn. For example, a way of putting um, these things in a, in a routine would be, um, for this sensory diet is for Emma. At breakfast, she drinks a milkshake through a straw because she gets a lot of deep pressure from sucking up something nice and thick. Um, she always likes chewy bread, it gives her lots of good, uh, heavy, uh, deep pressure input to her jaw. She, they change between bagels or sourdough. Um, when she's getting dressed, her mom does a little foot and hand massage. Um, when there's time, they'll even do a big sandwich uh, with a bean bag. If you've, if you've seen this with pillows or bean bags, we'll put 
um, the child on a bed or on top of another uh, bean bag, and then we'll squish down and we'll we can if they if there's someone that likes food, we can talk silly. We can talk about having putting down the bread and then and then putting them in as a sandwich. And you can be silly about making about uh, giving them little chumps. And I'm going to eat you all up. Uh, or if they want if they want to put on a nice roll of uh, of jelly and a roll of peanut butter before you put that bean bag uh, on top of them to make a nice peanut butter and jelly and uh, and a little Emma sandwich. Um, when they're arriving at school, we communicate these things with our teachers and the teacher gives them some quiet time to sit and look at the fish tank or do a puzzle or read a book in a quiet corner before they engage, start to engage in some of the uh, school activities. Um, also during, um, during school, they might have opportunities to use resistant bands or jump on the trampoline or get some feedback that way to, to calm their body and get that input into their muscles. After they get home, um, they before they ask them to do a lot of activities, they might want to give her that 10 to 20 minute time to chill out with her soft toys. Um, and they made a, a space under her bunk bed that she could cuddle up with those toys and uh, and have a dim in a dim time. Or maybe she might wanna do yoga, just something quiet and slow to help her calm her body before she transitions into home. Something that we don't talk about a lot is how much work it can be to be in a new environment at school. And that when we come home, sometimes parents feel like they're getting a big brunt of, and, but what, the, what it, they're really getting is that the children are, are kind of letting you know how stressful it was to, to work so hard in a, that new environment all day. And now they need some calming time. So it's not a good time to put on a lot of demands or ask a lot of questions for some kiddos. Sometimes they just need that downtime. And maybe later after they've had that time, maybe they just need to cuddle with you and, and uh, under a big blanket, big cozy blanket. Um, but they need that time to come down before they're able to, um, to transition into their home environment more successfully. Uh, before bed, Emma's parents do a massage uh, before she goes to sleep in dim light, uh, and they use a nice, quiet, calming voice. These are ways we can include some of those activities in our day to help our kids. I cited some great um, websites here that are related to um, sensory processing and occupational therapy, um, and they give some great strategies, and they're great resources. I think we're ready to open up if anybody has any questions or things they'd like to um, 